Bell Fountain Cemetery, built in 1849. It was the first rural cemetery west of the Mississippi, and it's long maintained a reputation as one of the most beautiful garden cemeteries in the country. It's also an excellent window into St. Louis history, considering it's the resting place to many notable and St. Louisans and movers and shakers of St. Louis. Carol Faring Shepley has written a book about Bell Fountain Cemetery, and we're gonna discuss it next, right here on City Corner. Hi, I'm Sarah Thompson and welcome to City Corner. Today we're going to talk about Bell Fountain Cemetery. That's right, a cemetery. It's located now, most people know it, in North St. Louis off of West Florissant, right where Kings Highway dead ends. But this cemetery, not only is it beautiful, but it has a long history and a really interesting history, probably more specifically about the people who are buried there. Carol Faring Shepley has written a book with an interesting title, title Movers and Shakers, Scalawags and Suffragettes, Tales from Bell Fountain Cemetery. So welcome and thank Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Sierra. So, Bell Fountain Cemetery. What first? How do you how do you come to write a book about a, a cemetery? <laughs> Everybody says that. Do you like vampires too? You know, are you a ghoul? Um, it was uh, 2004, the 200th anniversary of the Lewis and Clark expedition, and I had been asked to be on the board of Bell Fountain Cemetery two years before, and they knew I was a writer, so they had two longtime employees a gatekeeper, Manuel Garcia, and a superintendent, Mike Tiemann, each of whom had been researching the people of the cemetery for 30 years. I mean, they had, I had 11 file drawers full of Xerox primary sources, whole chapters from books, and the cemetery board said, we don't want to lose that information. They're getting older. Why don't you just do an oral history? So I went out and I started just interviewing them and tape recording them and I kept coming back. I thought I'd spend maybe six months. I said, this is so interesting. St. Louis has such a wonderful rich history and so many of the people who made the history are buried in Bell Fountain. So I ended up spending five years, you know, intimately involved with <laughs> the what you, cemetery. What do you think is so unique about Bell Fountain Cemetery? Well, the cemetery itself is unique um, because it is so beautiful and it, because it echoes the history of St. Louis. St. Louis, um, the story of St. Louis is the story of the settling of the West. The, the population grew, we were founded in 1849. In 1840, the population was 36,000. 30 years later in 1870, it was 350,000 mm -hmm. because so many people were moving mm -hmm. here. And there were a lot of, most people at that point were buried in churchyards downtown mm -hmm. or on the family land. And that land became increasingly valuable and these movers and shakers coveted it mm -hmm. because they could build some commercial emporium. So they kept having to move the cemeteries and then they learned about this new concept, the rural cemetery, which was putting death in its proper place, mm -hmm. not banishing it, but putting it in a beautiful place. And um, then it also had to do with um, 19th century picturesque ideas of the picturesque mm -hmm. and romantic ideas. Mm -hmm. And they became the first uh, public parks. Right. So, I mean, when we, it, public, yeah, I want to kind of go off of that because when we said, in the intro, I said rural cemetery. I mean, obviously today when people, Bell Fountain Cemetery is by all means in the city currently. But I mean, when we talk about a garden cemetery and a rural cemetery, I mean, at the time that this was built, 1849, it was moved outside of the city. And you were mentioning how, and in the book, people went there as if it were like Forest Park today. And we have some photos that we'll throw up of the architecture and the landscape, because it landscaping, because it really is quite beautiful. But tell me about the idea of how this was a garden, like the development of the garden cemetery. The, the first um, garden cemetery, cemetery was in Paris, Père Lachaise, in 1804, and for the same reason, they decided mm -hmm. to build it. And then the next was in London, and then the first in the United States was in Boston, Mount Auburn. Mm -hmm. And so 15 of the city's leading citizens 
banded together, formed a nonprofit corporation, which is one of the reasons Bell Fountain has survived to the extent mm -hmm. it has, mm -hmm. because we've never had anybody taking a profit out of it. The money that the people pay for their lot is reinvested mm -hmm. to go into making this incredible endowment, which has en enabled us to keep it as beautiful as, it, as is. it is. So they kept buying plots of land. So they have 314 acres. Then the founding president, James Yateman, mm -hmm. traveled to New York to find the finest landscape architect he could. He brought back Elmerin Hotchkiss, who had trained with Frederick Law Olmsted, definitely the greatest 19th century architect, landscape architect, who designed um, Central Park mm -hmm. in New York. He designed the grounds of Washington University. And so Elmerin Hotchkiss came back and spent 49 years landscaping wow. Bell Fountain. Every tree, every vista, the roads, wander around just to provide the most beautiful. It's very confusing to get around. Yeah, I know. But, <laughs> but no, that's part of the beauty. And it, it, it is a beautiful cemetery. I mean, it is very much like a park. And you were mentioning how people actually would go to not only visit those buried there, but treat it as going. Oh, they'd have picnics. And they, at one point, only the lot owners were allowed in, but they so, sold tickets to other people. And there was a streetcar line that went right directly wow. there because it was one of the biggest attractions in the city. What do you think was probably the most interesting thing that you learned from your research? You did this for five years researching yes. and it went there sort of every week. Wow. What would you say is probably, <laughs> what shocked you the most? Or was there something that you clearly as a St. Louis and probably already knew a lot about St. Louis history, but yeah. what sort of I, surprised I really, you? It did, I mean, I really didn't know nearly as much about St. Louis history as, as, you as did. yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I was shocked how mm -hmm. important these people were mm -hmm. in setting the way not just St. Louis and the settling of the West, but the whole country. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess maybe that was what shocked me was how ignorant I was. <laughs> right. Well, when we talk about the title, you have movers and shakers. I mean, mm -hmm. how did Bell Fountain Cemetery become the resting place specifically for, and we're going to get into the Bushes and William Clark, the people who are buried there, but how did it become the resting place specifically for very notable St. Louisans and wealthy St. Louisans? You know, I guess it just was, uh, I guess it was just kind of word of mouth. I mean, mm -hmm. because it was 15 of the most prominent citizens who set it aside, people who really had mm -hmm. a vision for the city, not just wealthy people, but people who cared, and everybody realized if you, this is for eternity. Mm -hmm. You know, if you were going to be buried there, this is where it would be. And then all the architects wanted to be buried there because it was so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And that brought another kind of, you know, so everybody kind of had their followers. Right. I guess. We even, we have William Beaumont, who was the first great American medical researcher. And then someone named Koku Chen, who died maybe 10 years ago, mm -hmm. he came from San Francisco mm -hmm. because he wanted to be buried next to William Beaumont. Mm -hmm. So that's, we have people from all over the world, that's not a, just from St. Louis. Not just from St. Louis. No, that's a good point yeah. to make. Um, well, let's talk about, let's talk about first William Clark, because obviously Lewis and Clark, everyone sort of recognizes that name. William Clark, we're looking at um, an image of him. Tell me about his, uh, his sort of his resting place, if you will, <laughs> at, at the cemetery. Well, he does the cemetery great honor being buried there because he is the Lewis and Clark expedition. Mm -hmm. I mean, he is the settling of the West. It wouldn't be without him. He was originally, he died in 1838, I believe, and he was not, obviously the cemetery wasn't founded, so he didn't have a chance to be buried there. <laughs> he was buried on the land of his nephew, John O'Fallon, who was the wealthiest man in the city. And there's an O'Fallon, Illinois, mm -hmm. O'Fallon, Missouri, Missouri yeah. O'Fallon Polytechnical Institute, all named after this person. Mm -hmm. And actually, he sold part of the land to the cemetery. And then in 1860, he's, his remains were removed there, doing great honor to the cemetery. And the monument that you see now, which has a beautiful obelisk mm -hmm. and a portrait bust mm -hmm. of, um, of Clark, mm -hmm. was put there for the World's Fair. Okay. And then it was it was rededicated in 2004, and many Indian tribes came and paid him honor. Another one that I know that there are people take tours, and there's tour buses that come um, to the cemetery. Obviously, a big attraction is the Bush Mausoleum, an yes. Adolphus Bush. So tell me about, we have an image of that, about the mausoleum, and I mean, it's 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 beautiful. Here, we're looking it's, at a photo It's of it. really yeah. one of the most beautiful ones in the cemetery, and it has a great story, mm. too. Adolphus Bush has a great story. Mm -hmm. I mean, he 
came from Germany. He was from a wealthy family and well-educated, but he was the 21st of 22 children. <laughs> so he thought he wasn't going to get a very big share of his father's <laughs> right. estate. So he followed his older brother to St. Louis. He married the boss's daughter. That's always a good way to get the top buddy. <laughs> he, he, he was an incredible genius of a businessman and obviously built this wonderful, wonderful company. When he died, he was originally buried in the same spot, but it was in the um, Anheuser mausoleum. It was right. his wife was Lily Anheuser, mm -hmm. and her father, Eberhard Anheuser, was buried there. Well, after a few years, she thought, well, this isn't grand enough for my prince. So she had tore the Eberhard Anheuser mausoleum down, moved her parents out back. <laughs> Picked her parents out yes. of their own, uh, I mean, their own mausoleum. Dr. Freud, what do you make of that? <laughs> and built this beautiful, beautiful chapel. The, the original chapel was a Swiss Gothic, and this is Bavarian Gothic. Wow because Bush came from Bavaria. That's a great story. It is and a another, great story. I mean, and it's beautiful. And another one too is, uh, is the Wainwright uh, mausoleum, which actually has on the interior, it looks like almost gold sort of mosaic. Yeah, and so we have some photos of that. Let's talk about the Wainwright mausoleum. The Wainwright mausoleum. Well, first, the mausoleum, art historians consider it possibly the finest piece of tomb architecture in the United States. Really? And that's just based upon the exterior because until the last five or 10 years, we didn't have permission to open the interior to the public. In fact, every book I read about it talked about the dome being blue, which shows how huh. historical inaccuracies sure. get passed along. They had read that the plan was to make it represent the sky. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's kind of a maize color. It looks right. almost like so a that, gold, yeah, gold. Yeah. which is the color that the sky is sometimes at dawn, you know, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. the dawn. Mm -hmm. And what's really remarkable, there's a stylized sun in the center, mm -hmm. and then there are little gold tiles set throughout, mm -hmm. and you can't see them all at once, so you have to walk around mm. looking up, and they almost sparkle. Mm. And then there are eight angels from Raphael, which mm. are little, they're called incorporeal. Mm -hmm. I'm really an art historian. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, um, they each have a, a distinct face, and then they just have wings, no mm. body. So. That's really quite beautiful. Oh, I mean, it's, you, it's exquisite. Do you think, in, did you find in sort of your research and with the book that there are sort of comp, artistic competition, if you will, of the families about oh, definitely. The, each mausoleum or, you know. What, people in those days wanted to build them. It was today, nowadays people, you know, build these giant McMansions and mm -hmm. that's a, a, a symbol of their position in life. Mm -hmm. Well, in those days their houses were, but so were their mausoleums. Mm -hmm. And there's a funny story. Wainwright was a brewer and a directly across the street from him is the Lemp Mausoleum, mm -hmm. and they both were on a bluff overlooking the Mississippi. Well, the Lemps built theirs later, and they built it taller to take away the Wainwright's view. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, it's really interesting. I think it's, uh, you know, in one glance, you just like, think a book on a cemetery, but it really is such an insight uh, to some pop culture, to the history of St. Louis, to how we in Western society treat death and really just throughout the 20th century how, um, to your point, even how economics and status are reflected. Really, really. Did you have um, a sort of a favorite that you, a favorite, <laughs> do you have a favorite person <laughs> buried at Bell Fountain Cemetery? But did you come across, um, again, through your research and your writing, did you come up with a favorite person? There's so many people I loved. I just, you know, I just became intimately involved with them. But probably the one that seemed is the most exciting was a discovery of James Buchanan Eats because okay. growing up in St. Louis, I always loved the Eads Bridge. I just we, thought yeah, we have a photo of him so as well. Mm -hmm. I just thought it was so beautiful. Yes. And in fact, now that I've done this research, I'm not the only person, like Ada Louise Huxtable, who was the um, architecture critic of the um, Pulitzer Prize mm -hmm. winning of the New York Times, called it among the most beautiful structures of man. Mm -hmm. Walt Whitman said it had beauty insurpassable. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. but he, um, Eads himself was such an incredible person. He was um, from a family from Indiana. They'd lost all their money, so he had to drop out of school at 13. He was selling apples on the riverfront. Then he went to clerk for a dry goods merchant who recognized that he was so brilliant, 
possibly because when he was stuck on a problem, he would play chess, which many people do, but he did it with his back turned toward the chessboard mm. <laughs> because it made it a little more challenging. <laughs> so he had free reign of his library, and he's considered one of the five great the, as uh, engineers of all times, yeah. and from self-educated. Right. And the the, the um, a, a book that I read called The Annals of Modern Engineering mm -hmm. said that the Eads Bridge was one of those uh, um, pieces of art or engineering that changed the way we live. Sure. I mean, out of all proportion to its actual size. You couldn't p cross a large body of water without some of Eads' patented uh, discoveries about how to build something. So he became one of your favorites, and I oh, know we definitely. have some, and then there's also some other notable mentions that I just want to um, throw up because we have some photos. There's William S. Burroughs is buried oh, there. He's and quite the opposite. <laughs> yeah, that's a little bit different. We're yes. talking about uh, writers. Um, <laughs> and then another writer, uh, Sarah Teasdale, um, who is um, a poet, and, uh, and I, I wanted you to, um, to briefly tell me about, um, before we, we're going to go to break in a bit, but to tell me um, about Sarah Teasdale and what's interesting and why you included, interesting about her and why you included her in the book. Sarah Te Teasdale is the first poet to win the Pulitzer Prize. So her poetry is remarkable and beautiful. It's got a real strangeness to it. It's deceptive. When you read it at first, you think, oh, that's kind of simple. And then, whoa, there's mm -hmm. this ugliness beneath it. Then she was born into a wealthy family. She was a very late life child. Her next sibling was 16 years older. Mm. and. Um, they treated her as if she was just going to break. She was mm. so special. They put her into school, they put her into Mary Institute for a year, and then they thought, oh, it's too rough and tumble for her, so they pulled her out. In fact, she said she felt as if she were born without an extra layer of skin, so. Oh, yeah. you're like, but I, I think with, the, with there's Sarah Teasdale, there's some women that are pretty notable that, I mean, with, again, the title, um, you have the suffragettes, and there's some interesting women that I want to get into, um, and we're going to talk more about Sarah Teasdale as well as those other women when we return, so please stay with us right here on City Corner. When you throw away money on wasted electricity, you're throwing away everything you could have bought with it. Saving energy saves you money. Learn more at energysavers.gov. kitchen surfaces, utensils, and hands with soapy water. One in six Americans will get sick from food poisoning this year. Keep your family safer. Check your steps at foodsafety.gov. Hey St. Louis, I'm Cara Kay. Keep it right here on STL TV. Shelters are the best places to find a new pet. You'll discover healthy and loving animals just waiting to become a part of your family. Find out more at the shelterpetproject.org. innocent things from triggering an asthma attack. Please make the monsters go away. Learn how to stop their asthma attacks at noattacks.org. I'm Sarah Thompson and welcome back to City Corner. Uh, today my guest is Carol Faring-Shepley. She's the author of Movers and Shakers, Scalawags and Suffragettes, 
Tales from Bell Fountain Cemetery, um, and we're discussing really the history of Bell Fountain Cemetery and the notable movers and shakers who are buried there. Uh, when we left off before break, we were talking about the poet Sarah Teasdale, but I wanted to move into another famous woman who's married that buried uh, at Bell Fountain Cemetery, and this is a famous name in St. Louis. It's the Lemp family, yes. and Lillian Hanlon Lemp. <laughs> Tell me about her. Um, Lillian Lemp was known as the Lavender Lady. <laughs> she was married to William Lemp Jr., whose father had made the Lemp Brewery what it was, a brewery that was more uh, important nationally even than Anheuser-Busch at the time. Mm -hmm. They had everything. They had wealth, they had social position, everything going for mm -hmm. them, and they lost it all. They had, then there was madness, suicide, mm -hmm. and uh, Lillian Lemp was one of the ones who was kind of at the beginning of all that. She, um, when Lemp married her, she was the most beautiful woman in town. I just mm -hmm. love reading the old mm -hmm. obituaries because that's what they always say. She was four feet 11 inches tall, had a 16 inch waist, and always wore the color lavender. In fact, she kept a team of seamstress on staff to make the on latest Paris gowns for her, always in lavender. lavender. She had a carriage for every day of the week. When to have one carriage meant that you were incredibly well <laughs> and they were all upholstered in lavender leather. <laughs> and they lived in the Lemp Mansion, which perhaps mm -hmm. you've visited mm -hmm. on Cherokee Street. And they had the worst divorce. I mean, mm -hmm. it, was, it was so much fun because St. Louis had probably 40 newspapers at the time. And boy, did they love a juicy scandal. Sure. I mean, it was headline after headline. You know, millionaires at war, accusing each other. She, he, she said, he taught me how to smoke. You know? <laughs> and, you know, he accused her of... Wearing, trying to draw too much attention sure. to herself by always wearing the color well, lavender. Well, what I love uh, about the book is that you've kind of positioned sort of the, I call it the juicy sort of, yeah. you know, the, <laughs> the page six, the juicy stories in sort of one section of the book, and that's because of either their, their just role in society, something that happened to them, or their mausoleum or graveyard itself. And I wanted to talk next about Herman Ludy's grave, because it's absolutely beautiful. Oh, um, it's it's, a, it's this sort of statue of a woman um, with glass over it, is yeah. it? Yes, but yeah. tell me about the story of this because it's really so striking and so beautiful. But there's a kind of juicier story. There's a story. great story about this. This is the girl in the glass box. Herman Ludy's inherited his father's pharma cow company, which still exists to this day, Ludy's Pharmaceutical. Um, and he traveled to Europe and fell in love with a beautiful sculptor's model in Italy. But she refused to marry him, so he brought back her statue <laughs> to St. Louis and put it in the entrance hall of his mansion on Portland Place. But his wife, as you might understand, <laughs> wasn't too pleased with that. So she had him move it out to the cemetery, and then he enclosed it in a glass box because marble will be deteriorate uh -huh. from the weather. And his wife is buried on a separate lot. Go figure. I know, go figure. <laughs> the woman he was that he was in love with, right. he wanted to, you He's know. with her eternally. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's so interesting. Um, I do want to mention, because I know we're focusing a lot on sort of the notable names, but there are Civil War soldiers buried at Bell Fountain Cemetery, and there's other sort of not so notable in terms of their right. royal history. So tell me right, briefly right. about that. Um, well, the Civil War, uh, Missouri, being a border state, mm -hmm. was just really torn apart. In mm -hmm. fact, the elected governor went with the Confederacy, and then he was forced to leave the state. And the uh, appointed governor, the provisional governor, Hamilton Rowan Gamble, who kept Missouri in the Union, is buried in Bell Fountain. Mm -hmm. But Missouri had the fourth most skirmishes uh, in the war mm -hmm. after Virginia, Tennessee, uh, I went, what, what the other, I can't remember the other one, but Missouri had the fourth, there was so much, and then we have major figures, as well as all kinds of just soldiers from both sides, of, and then we also have the biggest madam during the Civil War as well, too, so, yes, <laughs> yeah. yes, yeah, so no, there's, we've yeah. got it all. <laughs> oh yeah, before we go, I do have some other questions for you, but do tell me briefly, there is, um, we don't have photos of, um, of her grave because it's it's, it's unmarked. there's no it's an unmarked grave. Yes. But tell me about the madam who's no, buried at. This Mount is Bell Eliza Fountain. Haycraft who was incredibly generous. She built up a fortune in body houses, especially during the Civil War. Well, always because St. Louis was where people came from the West. There were many more men than women, so there was a great need for her services, mm -hmm. shall we say? <laughs> and then lots of soldiers. We were a great troop center mm -hmm. too. There, there there was Jefferson Barracks in the South and Benton mm -hmm. Barracks in the North. This was an important staging ground for troops. And when she knew she was going to die, she asked to be buried in Bell Fountain, where her most prominent clients were buried. And they, the members of the board said, no, 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 no. So she said, 
well, I think I might have to talk to your wives. And, so, <laughs> and they changed their minds. They changed their minds. <laughs> yeah. But they said it had to be unmarked. Yeah. But she was so generous because sure. the Civil War made so many widows and orphans, mm -hmm. women who had almost no way of supporting mm -hmm. themselves in those times. And she never turned anyone away. She had food and clothing. She was beloved. There was a pro they, they lined the streets of the, of the city for her um, for funeral procession. Right. So it's people really uh, from all walks of life from who have, as you pointed out, strong um, sort of heritage here in St. Louis and others that, that don't. What do you think this book and writing this book, how would you sort of describe um, Americans' perception and um, attitude towards death? You can just really see how it's changed. In the 19th century, there was a whole ritual of death. You put, you hung a funeral wreath. You wore a black armband. You wore black widows wore black clothes. You wore black armbands, and people were very comfortable with mm -hmm. death. Uh, life expectancy was only in the 40s. So people and and infant mortality was such that, for instance, like the Campbell family of Campbell House had 13 children, and only mm -hmm. three lived to adulthood. Mm -hmm. So people literally would go. They'd go to church, and then they. They take their carriage and go out to the cemetery every week. And Bell Fountain wasn't just, it has never been just for the wealthy. I mean, this is for ordinary mm -hmm. people as well. And um, families would go, lovers would have tryst in the cemetery. People were very comfortable. But, and people died at home in those days. Now we want to banish death. People, women use cosmetic surgery mm -hmm. so that they don't look as though they're mm -hmm. aging. Mm -hmm. People go to hospitals or nursing homes to die. We want to pretend it's not happening. So it's just not, People and well, for instance, mm -hmm. you know the the Bush Mausoleum, the the Wainwright Mausoleum. People built these beautiful edifices to death. Now people like the McDonalds or the um, Danforth family have just simple monuments simple. that just you know fit in because they don't. It's we're just it's not part something we're conspicuous about as it used to be. Yeah, the, no, that that's interesting. And do you feel that they're I'm going to bring up the role of religion simply because what's also, you know, what most people may know about Bell Fountain Cemetery is adjacent to it is Calvary Cemetery, which is a predominantly Catholic cemetery. Um, and with Bell Fountain, I mean, is there a role of religion in terms of the people that were buried there? What did you sort of That's discover? That's one thing that I'm really proud of, that Bell Fountain has always been non-sectarian. Okay. From the very beginning, it's been open to all races and all religions. Mm -hmm. and, and that, I think that's wonderful. That in fact, is. you know, people. Somebody said, "Well, where's the Jewish uh, section?" There is no Jewish section. We, mm -hmm. it, it's just, you know, everybody. Mm -hmm. It's all equal. Well, this is. I mean, it's really um, a fascinating book. I do want to mention that just because we have to, and we're coming to the close of the show, that this was the gold medal uh, winner for the Midwest Best Regional Nonfiction Book from the Independent Publishers oh, Award. Yes. So congratulations. <laughs> thank you. And it's available. You, you want to tell us where it's available? Well, um, you can you can always get it at the cemetery, and I recommend taking a tour because it is so beautiful. You can get it at the Missouri History Museum where they published it. Mm -hmm. You can get it at all the um, local bookstores like Left Bank Books or mm -hmm. the Webster Rose Bookstore, and of course at Barnes & Noble and on Amazon. It's And just recently it was made available for downloading for our kids. Well, that's wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I wish we had more time because literally I encourage people uh, to, to take a look at this book because it is such a great glimpse um, into St. Louis history. It's really, really interesting and I commend you on your dedication and researching and writing and thank you for joining us thank on the you, show to watch, to talk about it. All right, and thank you at home for watching City Corner and please keep it right here on STL TV Experience St. Louis.